All right, welcome back. If you're watching this later on the recording, my name is Scott McCormick, and this is the Cartersville First Baptist Church men's class, although I've heard we have a girl in attendance, and we're very glad she's here. We're going to be studying the Gospel of John. We're continuing in John chapter 3, a, a conversation between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. And before we get too far into the lesson, I want us to go ahead and reread this portion of John chapter 3 that we've been studying. So we have the full context, and then now we're going to finally get into that last paragraph and study one of the most quoted verses in all of Scripture and deep dive into what it means in context. So um, there's three people on my screen, and so we'll just go in order. Uh, Dad, if you'll please read for us John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Um, somebody from three of Luke's friends, if y'all will please read verses 9 through 15. Luke, are you in a position where you can read? Yeah. Okay. Luke, if you will read for us then 16 through 21. Got it, right, Dad. You can get started. Don't forget to unmute. Thank you. You can stay unmuted too. That's fine. Okay. I, I just, you know how... Or, Early on in a meeting, you're just rattling stuff around trying to get it in place. Yeah. Uh, John chapter 3. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one, one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sounds, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be done? <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to him, Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest not these things? Amen, amen, I say to thee, that we speak what we know, and we testify what we have seen, and you receive not our testimony. If I have spoken to thee earthly things, and you believe not, how will you believe if I shall speak to thee heavenly things? And no man hath ascended into heaven, but he that descended from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have life everlasting. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not, does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Very good. So, a little bit of review. We're talking about a man named Nicodemus who has come to Jesus by night. He is a, a Pharisee, a member of the sect called Pharisees. They are experts in the law. They focus on uh, achieving that personal righteousness that comes by good works. Um, they are, 
he was also a, a teacher in Israel. His job was to teach people the scriptures as he understood it. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, a ruler of the Jews, and he has come to Jesus seeking an intimate conversation about spiritual truths. And Jesus is laying it on thick. He right out of the gate jumps straight into deep doctrine. Truly, truly, I say to you, he says that three times in this passage and lays on him ideas about regeneration. This is the new birth. He talks about um, his authority as being the son of man descended from heaven. And where we ended up last week is this, this, these two verses, as this, and, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then follows that right up with four. In other words, all of this has been leading up to this statement. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But I want us to back up for just one minute into that verse 14. One of the things that we didn't touch on last week was this idea of the son of man. That this is Jesus' favorite name for himself. And this isn't necessarily calling to attention his, his manhood. In other words, it's not just saying, yes, I'm the son of God, I'm fully God, but also fully man. This phrase is a throwback to the Old Testament. And there are some claims related to who Jesus is that are wrapped up in this name that I want us to have in context before we continue studying John chapter 3. So if y'all will keep a finger in John, we're already going to jump out of John and into another book. Flip back to the Old Testament to the book of Daniel. Daniel is one of the prophets in the Old Testament scriptures. And I want us to go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. One of the things that God blessed Daniel with was the ability to not only have dreams and visions, that would prophesy about the future, but also the ability to interpret dreams. And here in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel's been given a vision of things that are and things that will be. A lot of this is wrapped up into eschatology. We're not going to touch on the eschatology part of it. I want us to look for this phrase, son of man, that Jesus is referring to. So turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. I'll write that up here in the corner. And we're going to start, I'll go ahead and read, we're going to start reading in verse 9. In verse 9, it says, as I looked, this is in his vision at night, in a dream, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. That's a million for those of you who need some multiplication help. A thousand thousands served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Now this ancient of days, this is God seated on the throne, God the Almighty, and if we skip down to verse 13, another person enters the scene. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one, here's that phrase, like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, a, a lot of times there's, there's people who say, well, Jesus never claimed to be the king of anything. Really? Because he calls himself the son of man, and he's pointing back to this person that Daniel is referring to in this vision. Someone who has come to the ancient of days and been presented before him, and all nations and peoples and tongues will serve him. 
he will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's the son of man that he's talking about back in John chapter 3. That's the son of man that will be lifted up, that all who would look to him shall have eternal life. Now, right there, right after that reference in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, is that verse that many people who have never darkened the door of a church, have never held a Bible in their hand, they've heard this verse. And this verse is such a wonderful summary and exposition of the gospel in one verse. And so I want us to break it down, to really look at what it means in context here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We can start at the beginning just with the word for. This is sort of like he's saying, all right, look, I've been telling you all of these great things about the new birth, about the Spirit's work to save sinners. And that's all leading up to this point, all leading up to this moment. This is, this is all of Scripture has now led up to this point. For God so loved the world. This God here is not a God. This is the God. This is God Almighty. Let's start writing these words up here. This is God Almighty. This is the creator of heaven and earth. This is the Alpha and the Omega. This is, this is the one who rules over all things. And this is the one who is doing the loving. When we talk about love, God is the ultimate expression of love. God is love. And the ultimate person who could love anyone is God. There is no anything that could love more than God can love. Now, here's this word, so. A lot of times, this is, this is interpreted as we're presenting the gospel, for example. This word, so, as meaning God loved the world so much. Well, yes, God loved the world so much. He's God. He's, he's, he's transcendent, and his love is transcendent. But this word so here means instead that this is the manner in which God loved. In other words, this giving of his son so that all who would ever believe in his name would be saved, that gift of God is the manner in which his love is expressed. The expression of God's love, the ultimate expression of that love, is in the giving of his son to die on the cross. Now, it says God so loved the world. This word world is, is cosmos. I'm going to sort of transliterate that into English there, cosmos. This word is repeated multiple times over the next few verses. But I want us to get a sense there of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, there's, there's this, God's so loving the world and doing something, and then there's multiple qualifications, multiple qualifiers in this sentence. What is the manner in which God loved the world? Was it a love that saved every single person on the entire planet for all time? Are all people saved? Do all people go to heaven? Well, the balance of scripture would tell us otherwise. Here, how does that work out in the sentence? If it says, for God so loved the world, I think a lot of people that hear this verse see a comma there, and they think, period. That's it. God loves me. I'm a sinner, and I make mistakes, but you know, God loves me. When I get to heaven, he's going to forgive me for all that, and it's not going to be a big deal, because God is love. Well, that's not the end of the sentence here. There's a comma. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave. So that's the action that he took. That's the, that's the transitive part of this verse. You know, where does the action live in a particular passage? You start looking for the verbs. First of all, he loved. That's an action that he's taken. Now, God so loved the world that he gave his son. This idea of giving is more than just sending. He uses the verb send in the next verse. For God did not send his son. This is a different verb. This is a giving. This is a giving over, a giving up, a, a releasing to this purpose that um, 
he's, he's giving him over in a manner that he's forsaking him. Jesus, even on the cross, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's, it's as though God turned his face away from Jesus. This wasn't just a sacrifice. This was a total rejection. That's the giving that he's talking about there. And who did he give? Luke, who did he give? Who did he give? Yeah, who did he give? It says that he gave whom? His only begotten son. His only begotten son. This this phrase, this word here that's translated only begotten, we saw earlier in John um, chapter 1 and verse 18. No one has seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. Oh, wait, no, no, it's a few verses earlier. Um, it's John chapter 1 and verse 14. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, of the only Son from the Father. That's that same phrase that's repeated here. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, so far we've been having a conversation here between Nicodemus and Jesus. There are some theologians who read this and say the conversation actually ended at 15, and that from 16 onward, we actually have John, the evangelist who's writing this gospel, now uh, giving us some theology and doctrine based on the conversation that Jesus has had with Nicodemus. And one of the reasons that they say that is that this word here that's translated only begotten or only son is the same word that John used earlier in John chapter 1, and that we see very few, if no, I don't think other examples of this Greek word in the New Testament. And so they think, well, John, it must be John talking at that point, that it's not Jesus talking at that point. That, that's not necessarily true. There are other reasons why the rest of this could be Jesus talking to Nicodemus. In my Bible, that part's still red, right there in the red. So the translators of the ESV said, well, that's still Jesus talking to Nicodemus. There's no punctuation there, so it's, it's sort of like we don't have a, a for sure answer. But that only begotten there, I wanted to point out, I had one translator said, well, clearly that means John learned the word from Jesus. Jesus used the word about himself. And then when he was writing the Gospel of John in John chapter 1, that's the word that he used there. But this is the only begotten Son of the Father. This is the second person of the Trinity. This is the eternal Logos that's being given up. That's the person that we're talking about. And if we look back at verses 14 and 15, when he's talking about the Son of Man, this is the one who is the King of Kings. All nations of the earth will be given to him for him to rule over that's the man who is being given up. That's why I wanted us to read that context there. Now, what is the purpose for this giving up? What is the end goal of this love and this expression of love? Because right after it says, he gave his only son, there's a comma, that dot, dot, dot. And now we get into this, this, this qualifier here. It doesn't say that he gave his only son so that no one would perish. It didn't say that he gave his son so that all would have eternal life. It says that he gave his son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Will not perish, but have eternal life. There's this qualifier here. There's a necessary condition to salvation, and that is a putting faith putting trust, relying on, believing in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, if, if you're hearing these words today, and this is an action, remember these verbs connote action, and this is an action you have not taken, then you are not in Christ. You, you are not the one receiving eternal life. You are one who is still perishing. And if you want that eternal life, if you want to live with God forever and see him face to face and experience the glory of being in his presence for eternity, then you need to believe in and trust in that name of Jesus Christ.
Pastor Drew gave a, a really great gospel presentation at the end of the sermon on Sunday, and he talked about how it's sort of like putting on a backpack. It, it's an action you have to take. You, you, you can't just have the backpack float around you and be on you for you to, for you to carry it. You've got to, you've got to put it on. It's sort of like putting on Christ. When you, when you trust in Christ, you're not trusting in just that he existed or even that he died or even that he was raised but you're rejecting all of the things that you believe formerly about whether or not God exists, whether or not he loves you and cares for you, whether or not you need to put your faith and trust in him, whether or not you can be righteous under your own strength. You reject all of that and turn and put your faith and trust on Christ. That's all captured here in that whoever believes. Now, there's these next two phrases here, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's two separate phrases. Should not perish, but have eternal life. These speak to two different components of salvation. Because as an unbeliever, you are under the wrath of God. The punishment for sin is death. That's what this perishing is talking about. This is an eternal separation from God in hell. More than that, it is an eternal punishment by God in hell. But if you should not perish, that means that you are now justified. You have been reconciled to God. You have been made right with him by believing in the name of Christ. And so you should not perish. And on top of that, on top of the justification, we see this having eternal life. This is sanctification. You are sanctified. Ultimately, the, the, the forever, the permanent sanctification is what you receive when you are glorified. When either you are a, a believer who dies in this life and is then present with God in heaven, and you all every ounce of sin is removed from you, you are ultimately sanctified. Or if Jesus returns, that eternal life begins and you are fully sanctified. You get to receive the glory instead of the punishment. I wanted us to see those, those two bits there. Does that make sense? Are y'all following along here? There's only, there's only a few of us in here, so there's not as much yeah. chatter today as there has been. Am I muted? No, you're not muted. All right. Well, I put my hand up. Oh, that was a collab. I oh, just yeah. moved away from those things. If you want to raise your hand, do like this, because oh, I can okay. see you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the trouble is, when I'm teaching, I seldom see that, and I need somebody else in class to say, hey, so-and-so over there's got their hand up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so is this a good or bad time to, to uh, or had you intended later to address how one comes to the position of believing. How, how one comes to the position of believing. Um, it, it, well, so far we've, we've talked about, um, I'll tell you what, how about you tell me what you're thinking? I, it's a good time to talk about anything if it's related to what we're doing here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Mm-hmm. How is it that you come to believe? Well, you, you come to believe in that um, somebody has come to you and, and actually explained the words of the gospel to you. The gospel is presented to you and told to you. The words of scripture, the gospel of Jesus, are the power of God unto salvation. And that in that opportunity, the Holy Spirit regenerates your heart, reaches down and takes your heart of flesh your, your, your heart of stone and makes it a heart of flesh and now being morally able to understand the gospel that's been presented to you and seeing the goodness of it for the first time, you gladly accept and believe in that name. Can you do that without the Holy? If you, somebody's presenting the gospel to you and the Holy Spirit is not regenerating your heart, uh, uh, are you in a position to believe? No. Okay. And I'm, I'm reinforcing that in this conversation now because so much of the time, um, 
you are you using an NASB right now? This is an ESV. You're using an ESV now. And you know, the ESV and the NIV, I don't know what the other guys are using. Um, but you know, we've got these subheadings and there's one subheading that starts in verse 16. Um, and that, that's the first subheading since the one before verse one. The reason I bring that up is because we, without conversations like this one, we can have a tendency to break out a piece of the scripture and interpret it outside the context. You have labored for the past two weeks on the work of the spirit coming like the wind coming and going where it will. And I still can see that if we don't bring it together now, there might be a tendency for some listening to segregate 16 on from one through 15, mm -hmm. such that we, we don't put them together and come away with a full understanding that it's the Holy Spirit that actually does the work. Sure. So I can summarize that real briefly based on what we've covered in the last several weeks. Um, Jesus' first statement out of the box in this conversation with Nicodemus is that unless one is born again or born from above, um, the Greek there is ambiguous. Both are correct. It's a second birth. It is a supernatural birth. Um, that unless that happens, that is a necessary condition to be able to see the kingdom of God. And in a sense there, we can say with confidence that until you're born again, until you're regenerate, you are in a condition of spiritual blindness. In other words, if somebody comes to explain the gospel to you and the Holy Spirit has not, and you are not born again, and that the Holy Spirit has not, has not changed who you are at the core, you are still spiritually blind. It's, it would be like explaining color to a blind man. And so if you go to one of your friends that you or, or one of your family members that you know and love and you plead with them for the gospel and they go, dude, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why I need to do that. This doesn't have anything to do with my life. I, and I reject it. And we're going to talk some more about that rejecting later on in this passage. That that means the Spirit is not working in their heart at the time. Now, that doesn't mean that He's moving them towards understanding. That doesn't mean that you are you are part of the seed that is being sown, that is that is um, growing them towards that point where then the Holy Spirit opens their eyes, opens their minds to understand the Scripture. But until the Spirit does that, they're not going to get it. Until the Spirit did that for me, I didn't get it. Um, and I grew up in church, and it wasn't until I was 13 that somebody finally said it. And I may have heard it many times before that, but when that man said it, then I understood it. And that was in the moment that the Holy Spirit helped me to understand it and, and made me able to understand it. So, yeah. So then, you know, then Nicodemus said, well, I, 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 don't, I don't get that. And so then Jesus goes through word pictures and analogies and comparisons bring the spirit to the wind, flesh versus the spirit, what the new birth looks like in that. And that's how we ended up where we are. So yeah, all of that's still in operation in this conversation that the two are having. Thank you. Good question. Did we lose Luke or did you combine with three of Luke's friends? I combined. Okay. <laughs> And, and my phone was dying, so I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it off. And that then, works. And then it was like echo. I was like trying to talk, and I'm like, that's probably echo going off. Like, that's good. Well, we've still got more to read, so I'm still going to assign things to you. So as we continue, let's get on to John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, there was a misunderstanding at that time about what the Messiah's role was going to be. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, this word Messiah in the Hebrew is the same word which in, in, in Greek is Christ, 
Both of these mean anointed, and wrapped up in that in that role uh, is the threefold roles of prophet, priest, and king. And the Jews were looking for a Messiah, but the Messiah that they were looking for was a temporal one. It was a man who would come and act as a a, a ruler, so to speak, to bring the Jewish nation to prominence again. But one of the, the it wrapped up in that misunderstanding of who the Messiah was supposed to be was a misunderstanding about what he would be in relation to the Gentiles. Now here in these verses, this word world has been used and it's that same word cosmos. It's an overloaded term in the Greek language to mean many different things. In some cases it means the whole created world, everything that exists. Sometimes it means all people in the world. Sometimes it means some people in the world of a certain, like all people of a certain kind, and sometimes it means some people of many kinds. Sometimes it means the sinful world as ruled over by Satan. Here in this context, Jesus is using words like condemnation and judgment and the word world, and Nicodemus would have understood those in the context that he thought the Messiah was going to come. Not only was he gonna lead the Jews to prominence as a nation of their own, but he was also going to punish and destroy and fight against Gentiles. I'll say that again. The Messiah was expected to come not just to lead the, the Jews to become a sovereign nation of their own again, but also to punish and destroy and fight against Gentiles. Well, where do they get this misunderstanding? Let, let's go read about it. Flip with me, keep a finger in John chapter 3, flip with me to the last book of the Old Testament, to the book of Malachi. We've done a little bit of studying of Malachi um, in weeks past, and in Malachi chapter 4, we saw a reference to John the Baptist, a prophecy that John the Baptist would come in the spirit of Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So before that, we get a little description of what the great and awesome day of the Lord will look like. Well, that's in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Dad, will you please read those three verses for us? Uh, 1 through 3? 1 through 3. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming... And the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from a stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Very good. So they saw this as a messianic prophecy, which it is, but they were turning this idea of those who fear his name into being just the Jews. And this idea of those who were arrogant and evildoers, who were not worshipers of God, they were turning that into all those who were not Jews. So in other words, the son of righteousness would come and would do good to those who were Jews, but would destroy and trample and burn up all those who were not Jews. That's how they twisted that scripture, that it wasn't a, an idea of belief versus unbelief, faithful versus unfaithful. It was just Jews as a, as a covenant community and as a nation versus everybody else. Now, there's more than that. Flip with me to the, uh, the book of Psalms. We're going to look at the second Psalm. I turned too far. Psalms is right after the book of Job. If you're, if you're holding your Bible open, you just let it fall halfway through, you'll probably land at Psalms or Proverbs. You'll be really close. I want us to read all of Psalm 2, and I'll read this one out loud, and then we'll have more to read. There's a lot of scripture for us to cover today. Are y'all with me in Psalm chapter 2? Yes. All right. Yep, we're here. Excellent. All right, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Who does that sound like? Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. That sounds just like that son of man passage in Daniel chapter 7. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, I, I don't know about you, but if I was reading that and, and I didn't, and I was, I was in the process of misunderstanding it, then I might misunderstand that to mean that when the Messiah came, he was going to do a lot of this judging and condemning that's described here. But here, turn with me back to John chapter 3. Jesus turns all this on its head. He says, you thought I was going to come to rescue the Jews and to make them great and to condemn and judge the world, meaning the Gentile world? That's the context that he's giving here. He says, it's quite the opposite, Nicodemus. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So it's quite the opposite. It's not just, I'm not going to condemn and judge and destroy the Gentile world as you thought I would. I'm actually here to save all who would believe in my name. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Even if you have never heard the name of Jesus, you are under his wrath because you have not believed on his name. There is not a, a forgiveness, not a, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't understand. God is, is obvious by the things that are created. His divine attributes are on display all day long in creation so that we are without excuse. And if you put your faith and trust in any other false God or even in yourself for your own salvation, then you are still under his wrath. And that's a very dangerous place to be. All of this that we just read, about him dashing you with iron, with a rod of iron, breaking into pieces like a potter's vessel, that's, that's you if you're not in Christ. But if you do believe in him, then you are not condemned. So let's continue. In verse 19, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Well, so he's been pretty concrete and clear. And then we get to verse 19, and he starts using these words again, like light and darkness. And now it feels kind of wishy-washy and fuzzy. And we go, well, I, I get that, you know, light is good and dark is bad and that, you know, those, I, I understand this concept of those who are evil want to hide in the darkness. You know, think about why more crime happens at night than during the day. There is this, there is this inner feeling that we have that we even know that we're doing evil, even if we're choosing to do it, and that, that we would prefer to do it at a time when no one can see. Light has this revealing aspect to it. Here, when Jesus says light has come into the world, he's referring to himself. One of the things that he does coming into the world is bringing true understanding and exposition of God's law and revealing the things that are within us that are dark and evil. 
And those who reject him, who do not come to Christ, one of the reasons for that is fear that the darkness and evil within them will be exposed. But where does the truth that someone who does come into the light, when it says they, when those who do whatever is true come to the light, where does that come from? Well, here it says, just very simply at the end, it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. But I want us to see an even more detailed picture than that in the book of Romans. Turn with me to the book of Romans and chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, Sorry, I got to flip there too. Here, we're, we're, we're going to study a little bit here about the Spirit's work in us and how it changes us. And so, uh, Luke, if you're still with us, if you could read for us Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And Chad, if you'll read verses 9 through 11. All right, here we go. There's therefore now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, know, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of this. And if Christ be in you, the body is indeed dead because of sin, but the Spirit liveth because of justification. And if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead shall quicken also your mortal bodies because of his spirit that dwells in you. Very good. So here Paul is talking about the relationship of Jesus and the spirit and the law and who you are in relation to each of those. And here we see some direct parallels to this passage that we're talking about in John chapter 3. We were talking about light versus dark. Here we see the spirit versus flesh, that the mind that, set, that is set, um, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the, uh, on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Light has come into the world. Jesus has come into the world, and those who have set their mind on the flesh are hostile towards him. The ultimate expression of that was when he was put on the cross, but they are stiff-arming him, rejecting him. Dad, you got your hand up. I'll let you interrupt. Well, uh, um, I, I don't know if I've talked about it in, in your class or not, uh, but you, you may remember from time to time, uh, Sinclair Ferguson will make a reference to um, visiting with someone. And the examples that I've heard him give were uh, talking to somebody who is in, in view of employment at his local body. And uh, he'd finally come to a question, ask everybody that comes to his employer that same question. And that is, um, what is it that you think about? when you don't necessarily have anything else to think about. And that's a question that stumps a lot of people. And uh, I got tickled by it, you know, when he would uh, tell that story. 
but it awakened me to the fact that I, uh, all my life, have allowed my mind to go places it should not go. And, um, and that, that is uh, frustrating to the work of the Spirit in my life. And therefore, it, it means all that much more to me now. And that's one of the reasons that, though at this late age, I started memorizing scripture as I had the capacity to do it. Um, it's a thing that when I go on a walk or go anywhere else and I'm not listening to something in particular, um, it helps prevent my mind from going places it shouldn't go. That, that to me puts puts uh, flesh on verse five for those who live according to the, to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, set their minds on the things of the spirit. And that, that's a, that's a, that's a nice thing to say as a, an ism for quoting a verse, Mm -hmm. but the real difference ends up being how often do we catch ourselves thinking about the things of the flesh and then taking control of that thought and turning it to the things of the spirit. And that's one of the things that the scriptures are especially wonderful to have uh, in hand. Good. Thank you. Yeah, here, here, this is, uh, this is couched in the, the context of setting your mind on And one of the points that I want to make in this passage in Romans is that the difference between someone who has set their mind on the flesh or set their mind on the spirit is that Christ is in you. If you are in Christ, then the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God dwells in you. Um, And that because of that, the spirit is life because of righteousness. He's he's life to you. When it says in John chapter 3, all those who do what is true come to the light, we're talking about those who have been changed by the Spirit. They are no longer living according to the flesh. They're no longer setting their minds on the things of the flesh, but the Spirit of God has changed who they are, and so the works that they're doing are now done in God. Now, there's there's this not condemned versus condemned. In some translations, you'll see not judged versus judged. One of the points that I saw a a commentator make was that those who are in the light, who go into the light, who do what is true, who are filled with the Spirit, who have believed on Christ— have judged themselves. They've looked at themselves and said, I'm a sinner. They've looked at themselves and said, I'm not worthy of salvation. And they look to Christ and say, therefore, I need Christ. So they've judged themselves and as a result are not judged. But those who instead say, no, 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 I'm good. I don't need that. I don't need God. I can do it on my own. I don't want to have anything to do with God. They're not judging themselves according to his standards. And so as a result, they are judged by him. And that's where we end up at the the end of this, of John chapter three. Um, Jesus is, is putting a bow on it for Nicodemus. He's saying you're either in one camp or the other. That this is a, this is a you, you need to take a decision. You need to make a decision. And we can see from Nicodemus' silence that he's gone from utter disbelief to marveling to now just quietly, submissively listening, accepting and receiving. And we don't see any further conversation after this between Jesus and Nicodemus. We see him later on in the book of John um, coming to Jesus' defense in a conversation with other members of the Sanhedrin. And then we see him show up at Jesus' death to participate in the burial activities and the preparation. Um, And so we see him ultimately coming to love Christ. But here Jesus is saying, it's one or the other. 
you, you, can, you can be in the light and come to me. You can judge yourself and believe on my name, and then you will no longer be condemned. Or you can continue to reject Christ. You can continue to live in the darkness. You can continue to live according to the things of the flesh, and you will be judged. And so that's where we wrap up. There's this, there's this concept, um, there, there's this idea that when we look at John 3.16, and all we want to talk about is love. And that's opposed to the real problem of sin, which is that ultimately sin is judged, and the payment for that is death. And, and Jesus continues to talk about that through the rest of this passage. And the ultimate solution to that is that God gave his son. And so as you go through this week, think on these things. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Think about yourself in this context. Where am I putting my trust and faith? Am I judging myself according to God's standards? Do I see myself as ultimately good at the core? Or do I see myself as ultimately very sinful and bad at the core? Worthy of God's wrath and judgment and needing to turn to Christ. Think on these things this week. And that's where we're wrapping up. It's 8 o'clock, so um, I'm going to cut us short. Y'all got questions or thoughts? Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you for coming. Um, I do have an announcement to make. Now that we've wrapped up this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, I'm going to take a break, um, and then we'll meet together later. So I'm going to take a two-week break. So that means... Not next Wednesday, and not the Wednesday after that, but the Wednesday after that, we'll have class again, and we'll pick up on John chapter 3, verse 22. We're just going to continue. I don't know what the date of that is, because calendars are hard, but um, I will send out announcements, probably by email and group me, because group me is hard, and a lot of folks still prefer email, but I'll do that. Sound good? Well, then, uh, Dad, will you please pray for us to close? It'd be my privilege. Let's pray. Father, you have showed us so much about light and what you have purposed the meaning of light to be for us. As good as light, as light disinfects, as light shining on darkness and evil, and evil cannot overcome it. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing that you have shined your light into our hearts that we may believe. It is also wonderful that you have given us your word as light, such that when we are in your word, we are in your light. And even though this is a closing prayer, I, I confess my personal weakness and uh, spiritual weakness to you and my own spiritual blindness in that uh, there are so many things uh, which still remain dark for me about what your word actually means. But as we close this evening, I want to thank you for every opportunity that you give your children to come together in your word. And Lord Jesus, we are grateful that you are here with us for that, because as we gain more light and learn more about you, we love you more, and we delight to know your word more, and then we see all the more why we are glad that you have taken the actions that you have, not only for our salvation by your blessed work on the cross, but by the work of the word and the spirit in our hearts that we might believe and have that life. So as we go our separate ways, I pray, Lord, be with each that have been with us in this study and, and bring us back here that that light may continue for the sake of the glory of your name now and forevermore. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys and girls.